one of the most Japanese voices and highly regarded and recommended for people when they're interested in checking out Japanese literature. Yasunari Kawabata is one of the most important and famous writers to have ever picked up the pen. Let's talk about the Izu Dancer today, coming up on the Codex Cantina. I'm dancing crypto. Yeah. <laughs> My name's Una. Welcome to the Codex Cantina. We take a conversational approach to literature, talking about some of the most important stories and authors that have influenced even today's works. If you're down for a conversational approach, hit that subscribe button to join us. And as always, to start off with publication information, Izu Dancers are first published in the magazine Bungay Jedi in 1926, and our version was translated by Edward Seidensticker. The first Japanese writer to ever receive the Nobel Prize in Literature, Yasunari Kawabata. This story is well known in Japan, and even the term odoriko, dancing girl, is used as the name for some express trains, actually in Japan today. Its influence is monumental, as is this writer on Japanese literature as a whole. And what's interesting is this was written when he was only 26 years old. This is actually one of his earlier works as he enters into the fray. And it is actually one of his more celebrated short stories assigned frequently to schools today. What I love about this story is the pacing is amazing. The structure, it's very calm. It's very neat. The characters, I feel, are flushed out. It just, it, it, it is done very, very well. So let's talk about what are some of the major themes we're going to be discussing today. Three major themes today. Cleansing class, and innocence. So in terms of plot, it's the end of the summer as autumn approaches in this valley, and the pouring rains have pushed this lonely student into the tea house. And the student has crossed paths with this troop of four men and a girl traveling around, and he's particularly fond of the young Izu dancer girl carrying the drum. Now at this tea house, the troop prepares to leave, and the student wants to know, where are they going to stay that night? The student catches up with the troop, where the man of the group strikes up a conversation with him and tells him they are from Oshima, one of the Izu Islands. The student announces he wishes to travel with them as he steals glances at the young dancer as they travel along. Uh -oh. They arrive at their inns, where it is once again raining, and the dancers are called to a restaurant near their inn to perform. The student's mind races, not knowing where the girl is that evening. Now, the next morning, the man invites the student to the bath. He spots the Izu dancer at the bathhouse and now realizes his grave mistake. The girl's dress and hair made her appear much older than she actually was. That night, instead of being called to her by the drums, he stayed back to play goal with the locals. He doesn't feel clear-minded until the dancers leave, though. The next day, instead of leaving, the troop decides to stay because they've learned of a party that evening at which they wish to perform. They ask the student to stay with them, and they promise to head out tomorrow. The student learns the group mourns a recent loss of their baby, and that had only lived for a week. The student learns everyone's relations to each other. The man is married to the woman. One of them is the older mother. The youngest girl is the man's younger sister, Kaoru. And then they have a maid as well. They read stories, work, and talk more of their past. They walk past signs that say no performers as they approach Shimoda. The troop members talk about how nice the student is to them. They stop at the inn. The student goes to the movies by himself because Kaoru was forbidden to go and be alone with the man. And the men don't understand why, but later the student finds himself crying. The student leaves for school, but since the girls were up late entertaining, they are too tired to get out of bed and see him off. As he leaves, he sees the young dancer girl who nods to him as he takes off. End plot. Man, there's a lot of, a lot of people there. A lot of stuff going on. I, where are we going to start with this one? Well, I guess the question is, who are the main characters of this, right? If you had to pick, let's say, two main characters, who would you say they are? So if it were me, I guess I would pick the narrator and Karu is the, the two main characters. It seems like it's their story of this weird kind of relationship that forms. And it's arguably that those two characters are the only two that appear in every single theme in terms of the innocence and maturity, in terms of the cleansing, in terms of the class divide, if you will. They're prevalent throughout this whole story and perhaps some of the major elements of it as well. Yeah, I would agree. So Kaoru is a very interesting character where she's in the twilight, right? She's not a child. She's not an adult. She's in between, and depending on what particular thing we're talking about, she may be the child, she may be the adult. She's 
she's in the process of becoming. She's the butterfly in the cocoon, if you will, right? Yeah, but one thing to point out that I kind of thought was interesting is as I'm reading this from my perspective of life and my time period, that when you think of somebody and what does age actually matter to their maturity, that's put on by a societal, quote, norm, so to speak, because today, when are you an adult? When is the exact time that you're considered adult in America in 2021? 18, 18, right? Kicked out of the yeah. house. <laughs> right. But are you truly an adult at 18? I mean, you could argue that you're not an adult. Uh, my mom would probably say 41. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it is important to note that not maybe a major theme, but societal norms of what our expectations are for the ages that we are restricted of how we live our lives are put on by differences between maybe an American view or a Japanese view. Or American in the 21st century, right? Of course, or, or the, the, the 19th century, and that's going to change. And I think that is important to note when reading this story of maybe how you have some conflict, conflicting feelings when you're reading about this relationship between these two. So we have some clues from characters in Universe in the story where the woman says, Dear me, the child's come to a dangerous age. And it kind of reminds me, like, the, the way that she plays the drums and the way this man just feels, like, called to her, it kind of reminds me of that feeling that maybe some old Greek stories would play with, such as, like, the sirens calling to Ulysses. And it's not like this very specific or personal attraction. It's this general draw that this man is feeling pulled towards. I think it's very interesting that they make the young girl the one that's dangerous and that the the narrator is fearful of her. And that's usually kind of a twist, right? Usually it's the, the dashing hero is mm. not afraid of anything and it's the damsel in distress. And we're kind of throwing those gender norms out the window and going with something a little bit new. And I found that kind of cool and fascinating. That's true. And we see that our hero is behaving to social norms in a sense, because as soon as he finds out that she's younger than he thought, he's like, whoa, like he, he ejects her from the mind. He does, you know, he wants to play go with the locals instead of watching, you know, her perform and such. And I think his relationship with her kind of shifts a little bit too, where instead of it being this, this not, not an attached romanticism, but this draw to her, it shifts into almost kind of like more of like a protecting brotherly love is what it felt like to me. Well, then we have this weird dynamic between these two, right? But then you have a third party coming in as well as the narrator. He, he's conflicted with his own feelings and he's kind of like resentful of his own personality and he's so conflicted. And then you have the mother then come into the story as well. And of course, we see then the motherly instincts, you know, this is this man's a predator and doesn't let her daughter be alone and make sure, you know, that she's always being watched. And, you know, that that motherly, I think, nurture nature thing comes into play here. Well, I wouldn't say that she thought she was a predator. I mean, she does make sure that her daughter's watched, but she does still invite the boy over to stay with them the next winter. Right. Like that's not something that you do to a predator, per se. But she does, she is aware of the fact that her daughter's coming of age, right? The idea of innocence going away and potential mischievousness, if you will, that a man and a woman can get to when it's alone. She wants to protect her daughter from that because her daughter's not a full adult. She's that dangerous age, per se, which plays into that innocence and awakening theme. So the mom is is playing her motherly role and that she is being hyper vigilant of her for her daughter's choices before maybe her she feels her daughter can make her choices for herself. And I think another theme that kind of comes into play here in terms of this idea of moving between states, if you will, is the idea of cleansing. You and I did that video on Shintoism where we we're trying to learn more about the Japanese way of life. We learned a little bit more about what was their first way of life. Some people would call it a religion, right? But do you remember how important water was to that? Yeah, and water seems to have sort of a little different meaning in Japanese literature than traditional Western literature. The opening of the story starts with like this, this sweeping storm that's just pushing our hero along the way and leads him into with this girl, right? And then when he's taking off the next day, we have cold drops of water plopped, dot, 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 
<laughs> and then in section two at the hotel, rain started pouring around the sunset. The sound of rushing water grew louder, and he was tired of waiting. So what did he do? He went to the bath. <laughs> and the Got rain clean. stops, and he, he thrashes the water where we have the quote, the autumn night was bright, washed clean by the rain. And then the opening of section three, the water had risen in the stream because of all of the rain. So we have a lot of examples of rain being cold, being thrashed, of it pushing our hero along on his journey. It's a very aggressive and maybe violent introduction by water in this point. And you'll notice there's all these references to bathhouses. For people who aren't familiar with what bathhouses are, uh, you may hear onsen, which is kind of like the outside natural spring, and there's also the bathhouse, which are a more modern creation where water is heated. You have rocks and stuff like that, some different chemicals in the pool, but they're all regulated, and it's this idea that uh, the Japanese have this way of thinking about water, of evil is something that can kind of collect or gather upon you. And you have to wash it away. You have to clean your impurities away. And water is one of the main components of doing that. There's rituals for how you do that. And there's even beginning of the New Year rituals for how you cleanse your body with water. And if you go to shrines when you're there in Japan, you'll find little water stations and stuff. And there's official names and, and uh, approaches and processes for how you're supposed to clean your hands and your face and stuff like that before entering a pure area. And we see all of these concepts, I think, kind of just woven in through this text, where in the beginning we have all these violent, cold, non-peaceful ways of thinking of water. And then what happens to our main character, right? He is thrown in these emotional and lustful thoughts, I guess. Uh, I, I don't mean for it to sound lecherous, but he does have, you know, these, these sensual thoughts for this girl. Until the bathhouse scene, again, there's that water scene again, and there's this flip from the narrative where he's trying to push her out and his impure thoughts, if you will, he, he didn't know at the time that she was younger, but when he finds out, he, you know, he wants to push her out. And then even water in the story, I feel like kind of takes a shift too. In, in the turning point at this moment, we have this quote, one small figure ran out into the sunlight and stood for a moment at the edge of the platform, calling something to us, arms raised as though for a plunge into the river. It was the little dancer. I looked at her, at the young legs, at the sculpted white body, and suddenly a drought of fresh water seemed to wash over my heart. So in this quote, we have, you know, he was plunged into a river, and the fresh water cleansed his heart. It brought the impurities away. And this is the turning point in the story, too. And you can see how the water goes from being this more aggressive and violent or turmoil-like state in the same way that he was, you know, thinking about this girl and, and, and lusting and following her and wanting to be around her. And then when he shifts into this pure state, realizing that, you know, she's not really an adult yet, all of a sudden the water becomes a drought of fresh water that washes away the impurities and such. I love the imagery here that is able to do that for him. And it's not something that is subtle, but it is kind of subtle at the same time if you don't pick up or don't know how important these cleansing rituals are to Japanese culture. And then we'll see at the end, right, we have Kaoru just watching water pour into the sea. And to me, it was kind of the idea about how we're washing impurities away. You know, they're going out to sea to be gone forever in a sense. And it all kind of is a sub-narrative to the story, the way that water reflects emotions or the state of these characters through the whole piece. There's a lot of deepness to water of all the different nuances that it can perform in just one short story. It's kind of yeah. incredible. Yeah. Well, and it's so it's so Japanese the way it comes across too from from what we've learned and studied upon it. Now, something that I think like I'm a little ashamed for not having picked up on, like there'd be these comments like when he, when you know they were leaving the the tea house. Yeah. Where will they stay tonight? I asked the woman when she came back. People like that? How can you tell well they're stay? So I'm like, what does she mean people like that? Like like what does mm. that mean? Right, and then there's those talks about them being traveling merchants, and they had to sleep at a different inn. I'm like, why do they have to sleep at a different inn? Like, I knew something was going on, but I didn't know if it was like a him versus merchant thing. Like, it wasn't clear. Did you know that part of the story, the way it's interpreted, is is part of a class discussion? No, I, I didn't pick it up the first time. I didn't know what it meant, but as you read it out loud, it's easier to pick up on those inflections of the specific words. 
Akutagawa would be so embarrassed by us because he puts Class Divide <laughs> in almost all of his, and, and they aren't contemporaries, uh, right? They are writing around similar times in terms of the economic divide was very big in 1920s Japan, if you will. So I guess one of the ways that you can take this is having to deal with that class differences, where if you remember, I mean, even in Edo period, like, like education was never really looked down upon too much per se compared to the rest of the world i should say when, when you look at feudalism across the world <laughs> yeah right but you know it wasn't readily available and along comes the meiji era which really pushed you know a lot of education and social reform and stuff like that but still the idea of going to this prestigious tokyo college he is in a higher class theoretically than the traveling performers the performing beggars if you will and I guess there's just all these little subtle ways of, you know, when the proprietress, the owner of a tea shop's like, hey, people like that, who knows where they're going to stay? She feels comfortable opening up to him, right? Those people, they're not like us. Hey, student, right? Like, like we've got money. We're, we're, we're higher class. And I think like there's kind of like in the same way that there's this shift from the student's point of view on the interest in the Izu dancer, Kaoru. We also have a shift on his view of the traveling merchants when he stays with them, when he learns from them, when they invite him back next winter to stay with them and stuff like that. I think he changes his mind on what it means to relate to people of a different class, too. I feel kind of I'm I guess I'm kind of disappointed in myself that I didn't pick up this earlier because you see this in many different writings throughout all different cultures that kind of that the traveling peoples almost like gypsy like peoples whether you're in europe or asia or the americas if you are like living in a wagon traveling around you're looked down upon you're looked as lesser than almost you know you don't have a permanent home you're not as good as us and i didn't pick up on that and i was like oh man but i guess that's kind of the point is we all can learn something from a story and new and see how that these different cultures can relate to our own if we just look deep enough for those little meanings. Yeah. Well, I think you and I also think when we think of college students, do they have money? No. Not in America, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> so when this kid is also giving her a tip, remember, she's like, wow, this is a huge tip. Like, like that, that felt strange to me too. And it wasn't as apparent perhaps as maybe, you know, someone who is either from that time or from that culture. I don't know if it's still true today. But I thought it was interesting once I kind of had had that pointed out to me. I'm like, oh, a lot of this is starting to click in terms of the money that he's able to do, why he stays at a different inn, and why at the end, when they're staying, not even at in Shimoda, they're staying at like the place where merchants have to stay outside of town. They're in the shanties, right? <laughs> and yeah. he finally starts to open up and stay with them in a sense and be like, oh, yeah, I, I will travel with you and I am one of you. And I think it's like that old trope of walking another man's shoes for, you know, 100 miles or whatever. He's traveling with them, hearing their story and empathizing with them. And I think that's what allows him to have a turn of heart and actually kind of open up to these individuals. Another little thing that is maybe not necessarily just Japanese, but a lot of times when we've read a lot of other stories, these stories have class distinctions based on money and wealth and here it's based more on how people are perceiving one another and mm. the way that it's portrayed in the story are those subtle mm. clues and not just how they're dressed or how much money they have or their job or their status in it's different in this story and i love that and i love that i've learned that too yeah that's a really good point because they didn't worry about where they had to stay or what they are going to eat like They'll figure it out. Like, they're not worried about those sort of things. Like, even though they're the ones that are more likely not to have the money to do that, you know, and they did worry about how much they got tipped and such. It was very different concerns from his perspective, too. I, th I think that's a good point. Yeah. So we will leave a playlist down below for more Kawabata docs. And if you enjoyed today's talk, feel free to leave a little coin emoji or something like if you don't know what to add but still want to help the channel out. Let's move into our subjective ratings and wrap up. Crypto, what are you going to give this one? I'm going to give this one a solid eight. I loved all the new things that I learned. It always just fascinates me how much I don't know about other cultures. And that's why I love reading about them is I get to know more about them throughout time and today and hopefully can become more relatable. And that's always a good thing. 
I'm kind of flippy floppy on this one. Like sometimes I'm a little bit higher, sometimes I'm a little bit lower. I'll go with 8.5 to kind of average it out. There's parts that were definitely hitting and striding with me and connecting and probably parts like we're talking about here where I didn't connect with it. And that's my fault. That's not the story's fault. So I don't want to penalize it for that. But there were parts that didn't, you know, fully, fully hit the engines for me. But a very interesting story and definitely worth checking out. Guys, we post videos every Monday and Thursday. If you would like to join us, hit that subscribe button to join us on the journey. Una out. Peace.